Welcome everybody to the Thursday night lecture. Uh, on Thursday, December 7th, uh, Tricia McClure and seven George Washington High School students will present Pearl Harbor Remembered. We were there. They, they've been doing a series of, uh, of biographies that's associated with the, uh, the uh, Veterans Memorial out here and, and actually our online stuff. Uh, you can see a lot of the biographies uh, actually on our website if you go to our website, uh, uh, go down and click on the Veterans uh, more. We'll bring up uh, some other search uh, options for you and you can take a look through those. <clears throat> Tonight, rail historian and author Tim Hensley will present the Norfolk and Western Railroad. It's Ohio Extension and Canova District. I grew up along the uh, NNW in a little town called Crown. And the NW is one of those railroads where so much passed through through that area. And over the years, a lot of it has changed. I'll tell you a little bit about Tim. Tim graduated from Marshall University in 1975 with a bachelor's degree in journalism. He is a former CSX resident, vice president of, w, of West Virginia, who served more than 13 years as an Amtrak passenger engineer on the Cardinal. Proprietor of the Trainmaster's House Bed and Breakfast, his Canova home also incorporates the offices of Pocahontas Productions, a rail and history oriented publishing venture that first released Cast Scenic Railroad, 50 Years of State Park, A Century of Steam on Bald Knob, 2013. He and his business partner co wrote Three Times a Lady, a history of the NW Class J, number 611, in 2016. And are currently working on books about the NNW Class A, 2664, and NNW stations. Hensley also writes a quarterly column for Rail Fan and Railroad Magazine. Please welcome Tim Hensley. Okay. Thank you, all. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, he and the staff up here have been after me for several years to come up and do a little presentation. Uh, I first put this together back in 1992, the 100th year anniversary of the Ohio Extension. We had the Norfolk and Western Historical Society convention in Williamson, so I put that together and made a presentation, so it's still, uh, after all these years, blew a little dust off and it, uh, still serves to tell the story. Uh, I was born in Canova, and uh, both my grandfathers were railroaders. I had one grandfather was a C&O engineer, but I had the pleasure of being a young uh, uh, brakeman and fireman for uh, engineers and conductors that had uh, come up under him. My other grandfather was killed on the NW in 1926 on the Beltline at Canova in a freak accident that uh, inadvertently involved Henry Ford. Uh, left my grandmother with four little girls to rear in the Great Depression. Uh, how they made it, God only knows, but uh, they were all very close to me and they're all gone now. But uh, I grew up in Canova during the last days of N W Steam. And, uh, I could look down off the hill where I lived and see uh, the trains below and occasionally my dad would take me down to the Canova Union Station to watch the Powhatan era come in with the Streamline Class J. And uh, then I went to the first and second grade in Canova at Ferndale Elementary and I could look right out my window and watch uh, in the first and second grade and watch the steam locomotives take water and I was a reprimanded occasionally for slipping across Route 75 and hanging out in the yard office but uh, it kind of inspired a lifelong interest in the railroad. Um, Willis Cook was CNO's PR man in Huntington and he lived about three doors from me and he took me under his wing and nurtured me, taught me a little bit about photography. Uh, I uh, got an interest in journalism and pursued the degree in journalism. 
found out you couldn't make a living at it. I worked on the Williamson Daily News for about six months. And then I worked three years for Congressman Ray Hall, and um, I hired on with the railroad. One of the first jobs I had was a midnight hostler at Hanley, and I worked with Rick Aguilar here. He's from up in that area, and uh, we worked many uh, shifts together and, and whatever. But uh, I got over, uh, I became an engineer in less than two years uh, after I hired with the railroad, which was unheard of in those days. And then I took, uh, I was uh, got involved in safety committees and things, and I took a leave to edit the Brotherhood of uh, Locomotive Engineers publication in Cleveland. I did that for two years, and then the company came to me and asked me to take a position, and I did, and uh, I uh, <clears throat> became a feature writer and traveled all over the railroad uh, from Huntington. Uh, many times I wrote three quarters of CNN, CSX News from right, right there. Had a really great b boss. Uh, Soon became regional manager of corporate communications and then director of state relations and resident vice president all within three years. I worked for a very good guy, was a native of South Charleston, Dan Green. He was active in state uh, government uh, here back in Rockefeller's administration. So uh, he was a great fellow to work with and uh, West Virginia is a very important state to uh, CSX and still is. But I got to do everything from uh, <clears throat> pull a dead engineer uh, from a wreck that he caused as a chemical fire burned all around. You remember the big scary wreck, Rick? So, and uh, did everything from that to personally being in charge of a major uh, visit from the President of the United States. I was the primary White House and Secret Service contact when Bill Clinton came to Huntington and kicked off his re-election campaign uh, there, and we put the uh, train together to Chicago to the Democratic National Convention. And I won't go into it, but I've got anecdotes and stories about all this along the way, but in the sake of brevity, we'll skip over that tonight. I got real interested in the Canova district of the N&W between Portsmouth and Canova, and... Uh, particularly because of the steam engines and the traffic and whatever. So I was a little more mature when I started Marshall. I'd been in the Army. First time I went to college, I stayed about three weeks and was all torn up over some girl, and I quit. So, But uh, I settled down after uh, I was in the Army and came back, and I put together a poster, and I would go out in the afternoons and... Uh, I went all up and down that old line and the big sandy line from Canova to Williamson. I put these in every church, every country store, uh, any gathering place, post offices, uh, whatever, in an effort to uh, seek uh, material on the old line, as they called it. And uh, so I got a lot of info out of that. Never did get a picture of the old passenger train out there or any really good pictures of the roundhouse at Canova, but uh, it, it served its purpose. Another thing that I did was uh, I started oral history tapes and uh, I would go to Portsmouth and Williamson and Canova and Bluefield and Roanoke and Crew, Virginia and all these gentlemen that uh, operated these trains and ran these locomotives. I would make tapes of them and uh, uh, I would tell them look you know I know the dry history that this was built in such and such and such and such a time and date and uh, I said I'm really looking for something more and I'd say I'm, I'm you remember any unusual little anecdotes or incidents that happened and uh, I would have seniority list of the men with me and I'd go yeah that guy he did this and this happened to him or he was involved in that and then I'd go down the division uh, place by place, you know, from an employee's timetable. And, yeah, this happened there. Yeah, uh, that was took place there or whatever. And uh, 
that way I got into some really good anecdotes and tales and and different things to blend into my writing. So uh, when I retired three years ago, I started to get back to my writing. Uh, I have a the publishing venture. We did the cast book. You can buy that in the uh, gift shop here. It's still in print. And we did a book on the Class J engines of NMW, and that sold out in six months. So uh, I started to put a lot of those anecdotes into that and these tales, and I've got kind of a folksy flair, I suppose. I won the award for the best magazine writer when I was at Marshall. So also have a bed and breakfast. Uh, take one of the brochures, feel free when you leave. Uh, I have a Smithsonian quality exhibit of railroad artifacts in my house and uh, uh, have quite a collection uh, and also archives and you know someday that may end up here at the state who knows but I've a friend died Lloyd Lewis two years ago and uh, I bought most of his collection from his son and then I helped his son market the rest of it so he was able to get about $35,000 out of all I was able to help him sell and whatever, so. Uh, but I've been involved two years with that. It, he had like seven storage lockers of things, big storage lockers, and it was just trash thrown in among treasure, so. Uh, with that, that'll serve as a good introduction and I'll uh, get into the, my presentation Um, the Norfolk and Western Railroad had its beginnings in 1838 when the little Nine Mile City Point Railroad was constructed between Petersburg and City Point down on the James River. Uh, over the years, uh, the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad was started out of Lynchburg toward uh, Bristol in uh, 1852, and along with the Norfolk and Petersburg and South Side, the three railroads were eventually combined into the Atlantic, Mississippi, and Ohio uh, under the auspices of General William Mahone in 1873. And that lasted until 1881 uh, when uh, it went into receivership and emerged uh, as a product of the Clark interest Philadelphia financiers uh, into the Norfolk and Western Railroad. And uh, it was primarily uh, an Amer agrarian railroad uh, from Norfolk to Bristol, 408 miles, and then uh, they got a uh, merger with the Shenandoah Valley Railroad. But uh, it, it hauled uh, cattle and grains and uh, tobacco and various products of uh, the South. Uh, even its headquarters uh, down through the years had a southern flair in Roanoke. Uh, when it uh, became the Norfolk and Western, as did the CNO from Richmond, uh, when it originally came from Huntington. So a lot of your railroad people, particularly in the southern part of the state, were originally uh, southern people, even as far as Portsmouth, Ohio, and places like that that was settled by a lot of Virginians. NMW eventually uh, called itself uh, Precision Transportation is what their slogan was. That's a Class A locomotive. That was their time freight engine that could also pinch hit in passenger trains. They had 42 of those. That's uh, the Cavalier at uh, Canova back in 1957, and if you can look way on down there uh, toward the tower, uh, that's my dad and I standing there. A gentleman by the name of Bruce Myers took this picture. And uh, as I said, my dad would take me down there occasionally, and uh, I can tell by the, the, the uh, blue shirt and the white shorts that he wore. So that was kind of his trademark, and I had a T-shirt on, if you draw that up. But uh, 
These engines uh, were built in Roanoke. There were uh, 14 of them. They were called the finest steam passenger engines ever built. That's the 602. When I was a little boy, we didn't think it was the Powhatan era unless it had the 606 on it. But I was uh, later fortunate to have a friendship with Bob Clater, who was chairman of Norfolk Southern, and uh, I kind of had carte blanche to run their steam program and do what I wanted. And I got to run the 611 for uh, four times, twice for 150 miles on ferry trips when they would uh, just move the equipment. They would call me and ask me if I wanted to run. And naturally, I said yes. But that's kind of what I grew up with. There's the A uh, on the Time Freight uh, 77. I grew up on the hill there in the background and I could look down and see uh, the trains. Uh, the old doctor that brought me into this world, he uh, had a pair of binoculars and I would climb up there in the evenings and we would sit up there in his picture window and watch, watch the parade of trains on the C&O and N&W. This is what I could see out my uh, first and second grade window. That's uh, my first grade window. I shot that when the 1218 was in excursion service. And uh, that's the yard office, that uh, brick building with the glass cinder block uh, windows. And uh, there was a water tank over there about the front of that locomotive and a standpipe where they'd take water. So my attention was often uh, more on the locomotives than my reading, writing, and arithmetic. Had an old teacher in the second grade, Thelma Piles, and she didn't like it very well. I'd have drawings of the steam engines, little stick drawings, and uh, she'd wrap me with a ruler on my knuckles. So the, some of the kids I went to school with still remember that. This is from the high side. Uh, this is number uh, 15, the Cavalier, which was uh, the uh, first rate day train until the Powhatan era came along in 1946. But uh, that's a 603. The bridge at Canova is the longest on the N&W. Each one of those uh, spans on each side are longer than a football field. They're 304 feet long and that curved uh, uh, top on the middle there you see, uh, the, it's 521 feet. So. That was one of the top 10 targets of the Germans during World War II. Uh, they kept a Coast Guard detachment assigned there to, to guard the top and the bottom with it, as did the railroad head guards with 30-30 rifles. Here's Santa Claus at Canova back in the 50s. Uh, one of the clerks out of Roanoke, uh, J.I. Kelly, would... Uh, dress up as Santa Claus and ride the trains for a couple weeks and the railroad would promote that. And people would come down and uh, to the depot there. There was a baby born in that freight elevator in 1926 that a woman went into labor and they got her off the train and she was delivered in the, the, the uh, brick freight elevator that you see there, yellow brick. That's the yard office where I hung out in the water tank. That was built in 1952, replaced the old yard office. The men would save copies of the N&W magazine for me. So I still have a, those. In fact, I ended up with a complete set. This, uh, I have the number plate off this engine, the 101. Uh, I can remember uh, one Sunday, uh, my, uh, one of my classmates' friends, and also he was a classmate of my mother, uh, he was a, an engineer on the yard there in Canova, and he took us on a tour one Sunday, and uh, I can remember getting up on these K-1 engines. They were constructed as a passenger locomotive and uh, relegated to local freights uh, in later years. They kept one at Canova for the uh, Canova to Williamson local freight that went down one day and back the, the next. There's the tire, KX tire, that uh, controlled from Pritchard, West Virginia, to Union, Ohio. I hung out there uh, many days with the operator and uh, Oakey Billups, and he lived across the street from where I now live. 
But uh, again, there's the infamous Class J locomotive. They're really beautiful. Uh, the 611 is refurbished in uh, excursion service now. Uh, don't know what the future is going to hold, but it's been run in the last two years. Uh, they put it away in 94, and then they got it back out. It ran 12 years before an excursion service. Retired in 1959. And that's the poster that I have there that I was holding. And uh, that's when I really started in earnest to research this old line. This is an old gentleman uh, by the name of George Smith, and uh, he was about 92. He started as a cowboy at Canova back in 1897, and uh, he was really full of tales and anecdotes and a couple of my lanterns there. I have, without I have the finest collection of N&W lanterns in the country. The globes are marked. You can see that one. Uh, the lower one, you can see the N and W on the globe there. But he was quite the character and uh, had a lot of uh, different tales and anecdotes. He uh, asked the train master to give him a job breaking uh, as it was call boy, and uh, he told him to come back when he was 18, and he, he did. And he said, if you want to break, he said, I'll let you break your damn neck. And uh, it was quite a dangerous occupation in those days for air brakes. They had to ride the top of the cars and tighten the handbrakes down with the brake sticks. And uh, that was uh, one gentleman said his sister kept a sheet for the express purpose of wrapping his uh, remains. So. This old gentleman on the right here is Walter Carter. He lived to be 101, and uh, he and I got to be good friends. I have about six hours of tapes. He's an old Virginian that came out to Portsmouth in 1910. That's W.P. Harris that he's with there. And uh, Walter boarded in my home uh, in the 20s when they were double-tracking the big sandy line, so I have a lot of his artifacts and whatever. The cowboy would come around and throw pebbles up on the window to... Uh, so he wouldn't disturb the rest of the household. Two NMW train masters lived in my house, so that's why I call it the train master's house. This is an early timetable uh, that uh, was in effect about the time they built the Ohio extension of the NMW. They started from Canova in uh, 1890 and from Elkhorn and uh, built simultaneously towards one another. And this shows the NMW before uh, the high extension. It had extended up uh, out of Radford and a few branch lines and whatever. Hadn't even quite made it to Bluefield then. But uh, it was built into Bluefield and Pocahontas in 1883. And the gentleman that uh, was the father of all that was Frederick J. Kimball. Uh, he had uh, been a Philadelphian, and uh, he went to Renova, Pennsylvania. He was a civil engineer, and uh, he put it all together for the Clark interest. He was uh, intrigued by the infamous Pocahontas number no. three seam of coal that uh, is uh, down in McDowell and. Mercer counties, and uh, he dug a pen knife. There was a gentleman at Abs Valley that was a blacksmith, and uh, that's what started it all, and uh, grew into the great coal carrier. This shows the uh, NMWs that eventually grew. Uh, it was. Uh, finally completed the last physical part of it in uh, 1901 when they uh, took over the Cincinnati, Portsmouth, and Virginia between Cincinnati and Portsmouth. And uh, they had it changed the character of the railroad from a southern agrarian road to a, a mighty Pocahontas coal carrier and major uh, 
Midwest uh, Atlantic trunk route. You can see all the branch lines in West Virginia there, southern West Virginia that uh, reached like a tentacles of an octopus to tap all the rich seams. This is an early uh, locomotive uh, down at Sardinia of the Cincinnati, Portsmouth, and Virginia. 440 type. This is the Soda Valley uh, Pass, and uh, the NW bought the Soda Valley between uh, Cold Grove and Columbus in 1890. Uh, when it uh, went into receivership, they bought it at public auction. Uh, it uh, is what inspired them to complete the high extension to connect to it from the Bluefield Elkhorn area uh, on through in the construction of the Canova Bridge. And it was constructed under the auspices of the West Virginia and Ironton Railroad. Uh, they would often have a guise to kind of hide what they were doing. And this came, uh, found that out at the courthouse at Wayne that uh, they'd issued to one of the contractors. There were 15 contractors that worked on the Ohio Extension and uh, about 5,000 men and a multitude of uh, mules and carts and dynamite. This is a early picture at Canova as the bridge was being completed about 18 and 91. Uh, you can see the old Glenwood Hotel under construction there. Parts of that is still standing. Uh, it was uh, constructed of stone and brick. The NW had kind of a land company subsidiary and a hotel subsidiary. They had the Bluefield Inn and the Maple Shade Inn at Pulaski, Virginia, and uh, uh, the Radford Inn. So. They, the Hotel Roanoke, which uh, is still uh, in operation today. But they went around to all these places and uh, constructed hotels and whatever. This is an early train on the high extension. On a Sunday, they had an excursion out of Bluefield and out beyond Elkhorn to observe uh, the progress that was being made in the construction. A 4-4 uh, O-type locomotive, and that's done out of the white system of uh, classification. You see the two driving wheels there and the two uh, pony trucks on the uh, lead, and you, you double that on each side, and that's how you get the 4-4-0 the uh, wheel arrangement designation. This is at Buffalo Creek, uh, out and back at Canova, uh, in Wayne County. Early water tank and locomotive that was used during the construction of the high extension. Here's a local timetable that uh, went into effect with the Soda Valley and Canova divisions in 1880. 1891, before they completed the extension, they had a mixed train out to Dunlow, as you can see there. And it went, uh, they had a Y track out there and they'd go out and turn it and whatever, but it would deliver construction supplies as well as develop trade along the route. You see a lot of these places, Genoa, that was near where my grandfather was from, Fleming. Ferguson, Dunlow. The old depot at Dunlow still stands. And this is the first train uh, over the High River Bridge at Canova, all decorated up with bunning and whatever. This is the first train uh, to run through when the High Extension was officially uh, completed. On September 22nd, 1892, this was made uh, on September 24th of 1892 at the west end of Dingus Tunnel. 
and that day is my birthday, so I feel feel some uh, kindred spirit to my calling. Uh, this carried Major Sands, who was the right-hand man of uh, uh, Frederick Kimball, through on an inspection train to, to look over the work. Had you been a passenger on one of those early trains, this is what one of your passes would have looked like. Uh, they were issued uh, to various people, uh, complimentary that they did business with to the railroad and whatever. Had clergy tickets and things of that nature. I have a, a complete NMW pass collection from the 1881 all the way up into the uh, in the passenger service in the mid-1960s and 70s. This is an early train uh, out at, uh, about Nolan. That tall gentleman there was H.K. Elliott, the conductor. Again, that's a 440 type, and uh, he founded the Norfolk and Western Veterans Association. He he moved to Columbus in later years, and uh, he had to run from uh, Columbus to Canova over the Soda Valley Division. But they uh, established the division headquarters at Canova and uh, completed a really nice two-story brick Union Station uh, in 1894, and the upstairs was for the offices of the Canova Division. The Canova Division uh, extended from Canova to Gray, which is now Lindsay, down below Williamson and Devon. And the Pocahontas Division uh, extended from Gray to uh, uh, Bluefield. In 1901, they moved the terminal and established it at Williamson, and the crews ran from uh, Williamson to Portsmouth and from uh, Bluefield to Williamson. You can see various meets of trains and whatever. Ferguson Coal Track and Radnor Fleming. Coleman is where my grandfather that was an N and W yard conductor was that's where he was from. Right near Wayne there. This is the Union Station at Canova and uh, you can see the tire out there at the west end of the platform and the sheds and the lower tracks. Uh, serve the CNO, but those uh, upper offices, uh, it was built in two stages. You can see a discoloration of the brick there above the uh, uh, Georgian uh, rounded windows with the keystones, and uh, that part was later added on. Uh, the part over on the right was what was original, and uh, uh, that, that second story was uh, expanded in the later years, early before the turn of the century. This gentleman in the chair there is David Harvey Barger. He was the first superintendent of the Canova Division. And uh, he was from Shawsville, Virginia. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the, the estate of Walnut Cove down there, that big brick uh, Annabella Mansion over on the right of 460 with all the pasture land and whatever and the fencing. Uh, that was his property. He was also in the coal business and uh, he had a bakery in Bluefield and uh, he had a mill on his property down there at Shawsville and had a famous flyer. Uh, the gentleman over on the right is Joseph Robinson. Uh, set in and he was a uh, superintendent of the Scioto Valley Division. But uh, Barger was, he was called Black Barger, he's about six foot four and uh, started as a conductor on the old line. Later uh, was general claim agent on the NW before he left the railroad. Here's an early view of the single track bridge of, uh, as, uh, from the high side at Canova. Quite a bottleneck uh, when they later double-tracked the railroad uh, in 1907. 
pretty much had it double tracked all the way from Norfolk to Columbus. And uh, with a few single track exceptions, the bridge being one of them. And here's uh, the different passenger trains that operated uh, early over the Soda Valley Division in the Canova. Had a Pullman Palace car uh, sleeper from Chicago to Canova daily. So that was quite a uh, posh uh, thing for a train to have in those days, those early rudimentary days. This is uh, one of the waybills of the Cincinnati, Portsmouth, and Virginia. They call it the Pocahontas route. That's the part that uh, extended uh, from Portsmouth to uh, Cincinnati. And you see they mentioned Canova and Ironton. <clears throat> this is at Nolan, West Virginia, in the uh, early passenger train. The local that went up the old line, as they say. This is a clergyman's ticket from Wayne to Coleman. That's where my grandfather was from, Coleman, as I've previously said. And, uh, from 1895, when they tore the uh, station at Wayne down in the 70s, I found that down in the, the uh, uh, framework of it. So that was quite a find. And this is Coleman little flag stop they had there and uh, the road as you see it uh, which was 52 and for many years 152 and quite a quite a uh, rich uh, place and heritage Here's Barger's Pass that he got from the Cincinnati, Portsmouth, and Virginia. Again, he was the first superintendent at Canova. This is a CP and V train, Cincinnati, Portsmouth, and Virginia down at Sardinia, Ohio. 260 type. And this is uh, a reflection of uh, the time they moved the headquarters uh, uh, of the terminal to uh, Williamson. That's the first roundhouse they had at Williamson. Uh, one time they had three roundhouses standing at, at Williamson back in the 40s. But that, that's similar to the roundhouse at Canova. It was uh, originally 16 stalls and then some of it was moved to Columbus and it remained eight stalls for most of its life. Here's an early picture of Williamson and the original station. And later on, back in the tens and the teens, we see uh, the second roundhouse down there has been constructed and uh, the older one was for the smaller engines. And there's a view of the business section of Williamson. As it started to burgeon. And the yards. Pretty much that area remains as it is today. The leads and everything are similar. Downtown Williamson also have a quite a collection of postcards between uh, I, I collected all of West Virginia for a while, but I sort of honed it down to the railroad and the Pocahontas coal fields. I have several huge albums of coal fields uh, between uh, Canova and Bluefield that uh, reflect the coal field area. First National Bank of Williamson in his early days. This 
Second Avenue. Some of that, those buildings are still standing. That's uh, in the area of the old Ball Funeral Home over on the left there. And the station that was uh, built in 1907 at Williamson, that still stands today, that's the City Hall. It was constructed and then in 1926 it was moved due to some viaduct work and whatever that took place. But uh, uh, that's uh, kind of a standard NW brick, first class combination brick uh, design, as they called it. Borland Colliery is an early uh, view of that. That was owned by a gentleman by the name of Stone from Roanoke that had stone printing. And uh, the railroad had a coaling station there where they could take coal. The, the actual mine was over in Kentucky and in, uh, in Pike County. And uh, this mine, uh, oh, it lasted uh, on up into the 50s, but it had, it had some early labor troubles. Uh, and the stone interest uh, and Roanoke interest, interest divested of it. This is Mate One. Uh, there's the depot uh, on the upper uh, right there. I did a reconstruction of the depot for Massey Energy, the Mate One Depot replica in the museum. I did that for Don Blankenship. Uh, I had beat him in the legislature several times on the overweight coal truck bill, and he had respect for me. I, a lot of people don't like Don, but he was good to me. And uh, he wanted to do something for the area, and uh, he wanted to reconstruct the depot. So we did that on uh, over in the, the left here area, and that still stands today. Unfortunately, we did a Smithsonian uh, quality presentation and uh, they haven't done much with it since. They've kind of let it go to seed. This is Thacker, uh, which was uh, an early hub of uh, what became Mingo County. Uh, Thacker Coal and Coke. Uh, not much left there today, but some of the buildings are still up the holla. This is at Canterbury on the old line. Uh, the original Norfolk and Western route that was constructed up 12 pole via Wayne Dunlow and uh, Dingus. There's an old train order that was written from Canterbury. It kept pushers there. The grade up to the Dingus tunnel was really tough on westbound coal trains and uh, there were several pushers that were kept down at the bottom of the hill and there's one of them, 303. I have a lot of oilers like that gentleman has, the old long-necked oilers, handmade. That was a symbol of pride of the engineers. Tenors would make those and put their names on them and so you can see there's a couple pushers in the siding waiting to shove trains up over the mountain. And this is looking uh, west at Canterbury. This is all abandoned now. It was abandoned in 1933 between Wayne and Lenore. Another of the shelter shed at Canterbury. Here's a wreck up along the 12 pole line in the old days. I never have been able to document anything uh, specific as to where that was, and I've researched these things pretty hard, so just, just haven't been able to find it. That's the engine down 12 pole there. Had several notable wrecks out there with loss of life to the trainman in particular. This is uh, the section force at Ardell. The old signs had the difference between uh, Columbus and uh, uh, Norfolk. If anyone knew Lowell Cade was the, was the sports editor of the Herald Dispatch, that was his grandfather that was uh, John uh, Cade that was the section foreman sitting on the car there. 
old lever car as they call it. Some people call it a hand car, but the railroad officially called it a lever car. This is at Wayne, 280 uh, class G type engine crew. Had a water tank at Wayne and a coaling station. And uh, the uh, trains backed up. That's a sealed freight going uh, east. This is at Canova. That's a engineering force. In 1902, uh, the, the gradient of the uh, old line and uh, the restrictions on the uh, uh, coal that it caused and uh, how crooked it was and how uh, the timber and coal reserves never played out as they were projected by Aspenwall and Lowe and some of the other people. Uh, there were very few mines that ever really developed out there. They had a Hope Splint Coal Company at Ferguson and one at Dunlow and a pearl mining at Dingus. But uh, that, that uh, it was a lot of it was cannel coal. And uh, um, after the timber was harvested, uh, there wasn't a whole lot to generate traffic along the way. So in 1932, this was taken in 1903 on, at Tunnel 3, uh, they started construction of the Big Sandy Line between Canova and uh, Naugatuck. And uh, it was open to traffic on December 15, 1904. And there was a gentleman uh, uh, with a cut out around uh, the area between uh, Crum and uh, Webb down in that area, down in Randy's territory down there. And uh, this, uh, they had an old gentleman by the name of Harlow that was a section foreman. And uh, he uh, had uh, suffered a accident in train service and lost his leg and he had a wooden peg leg. And there was a mule that uh, uh, was used in the construction of this big sandy line and some type of a devastating injury happened to it and uh, apparently they tied dynamite around its head and dug a hole for it and let it down into the hole and uh, as the I guess it was spooked by the fuse and it came up out of the hole and toward the old man Harlow and uh, he was hobbling around on, on his peck leg and hollering head that mule head that mule and uh, all the men would tease him about that for years and every time they'd see him and you know they'd get back and hide somewhere and holler head that mule this gives you a good uh, understanding of uh, the old line and the new line this old part over on the right there as I said that was uh, opened in 18 and 92 and uh, then over on the left that big sandy line between Canova and Naugatuck it was open to traffic in 1904 the part out to East Lynn was uh, constructed as the Big Sandy, East Lynn, and Guyane Railroad, a little short line by the Perry interest. And uh, N&W took that over in 1907 and 8. And uh, once they uh, opened this new line over on the left, all the mainline passenger trains were moved over there, as was the westbound coal traffic and the more important time freights. And as they returned uh, from the Midwest back to the mines, the old line over on the right was used as an eastbound double track. And the empties came back that way, uh, as well as the lesser seal freights. Uh, there was a local freight established every day and also a local passenger train between uh, Canova and Williamson. 
27 and 28, and that lasted up until the old line was abandoned in, uh, in uh, 1933. But if you'll look at Wayne there and then uh, go down and locate Lenore down near Nolan and Naugatuck, there was a branch line built out uh, from Lenore called the Pigeon Creek Branch. And they abandoned the old line between uh, Wayne and uh, Lenore in 1933 and turned the roadbed over to the state. And that was part of the original highway, and some of it you can still drive on out there today. Bridges, uh, they've replaced a lot of the bridges recently, but a lot of the old girder bridges and everything were still there. This is Portsmouth when it was established as a big terminal at Canova's expense. The main shops were moved out of Canova and moved over to Portsmouth. You can see a full circle roundhouse there in the left center. And then the back shop is the long building over there on the uh, right. And that lasted, it's still standing today, and lasted up in the, in the steam. And uh, it assisted Roanoke with the major rebuilding. Original division office and an old uh, 060 switch engine at Portsmouth. This is a shea that was made for Elkhorn Mountain there. It was used on the hump at Portsmouth, the engine in the foreground there, the 56. And you can see the hump there behind those three engines together. But uh, it, that was his last duty was to work Portsmouth. more of the facilities at Portsmouth. And the Canova District as it became and which uh, entertained my primary interest uh, extended from, from Williamson through Canova to Portsmouth. And uh, still very much a mainline railroad today with double stack trains and automobiles, solid trains, automobiles every day and uh, a lot of traffic on it. An old timetable back in the early years, I guess 1908. This is a section force at uh, Wayne under Walter Perdue, the gentleman in the bowler. Uh, the two Lindsay brothers, uh, the two uh, Negro gentlemen. Uh, there was a gentleman named Lindsay. One of their relatives that fed the crews at Wayne, and they were the only black family that lived there. But uh, Lindsay, uh, as they called him, I won't repeat what they called him, but that's the way things were in those days. And uh, you know, the crews uh, uh, would order ahead, and that's the only chance they had to eat between Portsmouth and Williamson, and uh, he. They'd wire ahead and he'd have baskets of fried chicken and whatever for them. This is lining the Dingus Tunnel in 1914 with brick. You can see the platforms and everything. It's completed out and done between 1907 and 1914. Some of the first signals on the N&W were up the Dingus Tunnel. And that's at the west end. Of course, you can drive through the tunnel today. It's got quite a reputation. There's the station at Dingus. One time a sack, they were hunting moonshiners and a sack of sugar opened up and they followed the trail of the sugar to find the steel. A lot of moonshining going on. It's pretty mean up in there, breeding and, and Dingus were very mean areas. Still, still are today to some extent. This is Governor Hatfield special. Uh, I believe it was 1912 when he ran for governor and shows uh, his special train at Wayne Courthouse, Dunlow, Breeden, Cerrito, Buffalo Creek, Dixon. I found that out in the uh, old depot at Dunlow. Quite an interesting piece. There's a station at Lenore. This 
This is uh, Mr. and Mrs. McCain, and they were both, uh, they both later moved to Canova. Uh, I uh, talked with the old uh, lady there on the left on her deathbed, but uh, they were both telegraphers on the railroad. And uh, they were at Naugatuck, and they would ride uh, number uh, 27 on a Sunday up to Lenore and uh, walk back to Naugatuck. That was their Sunday ritual. This is at Naugatuck, uh, Y class locomotive with a westbound coal train. You can see the tire just beyond the locomotive there at the uh, uh, west leg of the Y. It was a Y track there. Uh, after the uh, big sandy line was open. That, that uh, tower has been long gone, probably gone since the 30s. This is at Chatteroy, down near Williamson. Uh, the uh, N&W had some fuel mines down there called Howard Collieries. They had fuel mines at Vulcan and Pond Creek and uh, Howard uh, Collieries at Chatteroy and for a while at uh, Keystone. They found it cheaper to mine their own coal for locomotive fuel. They sold it commercially as well. I've got some script that says uh, from each of these places that says like Vulcan Collieries of NMW Railway and Howard Collieries of NMW Railway, Pond Creek Collieries of NMW Railway. Another view of Williamson as it started to expand. It's a YMCA at Williamson that was built in 1907. That's where the crews stayed and you get anything from a haircut to there was a commissary and ran by Virginia Supply in the bottom where you could buy your overalls and whatever you need. Uh, served excellent meals. Ran by a man with the name of W.H. Weaver. I made a tape of him and he had a lot of interesting stories about the shenanigans that went on inside and whatever. Um, in 1912 and 13, they double tracked the Canova Bridge and uh, they just built a new structure around it and didn't even stop traffic. And uh, they averaged the train over the bridge about every 15 minutes. But there's some of the steel work laid out and whatever. And there it is, building the new structure around the old, out in the main channel. There's the new bridge and the little side area there for the construction locomotives to get off and out of the way and around it. And the 1913 flood caused a little havoc with it. That's over in the area of uh, Beach Street, uh, right near the pumpkin house down there, if anybody's ever been to the pumpkin house that Rick Griffith has, but uh, it's on down the street to the right there. And there's the finished product. They kept a bridge watchman there. That lasted up into the 60s. And uh, he had a uh, um, phone line to the tire and the yard office at Canova. And part of his duties, uh, they had sand out there. And he would hump that sand up around the rail, and after each train passed, he would go inspect that to see if it, was, if it were any wider than the normal length. And that would tell them they had a, a loose wheel or whatever. All that's done electronically now, but that's, that's sort of the old uh, days that you could see. And he would... The, the tire operator could inspect the train on the far side and he would have to come over as the train passed to uh, the uh, downriver side. This is a fire at uh, Williamson, 1907. 
near the depot area. More Williamson from the west end. Uh, that's pretty much the depot as it ended up and as it was moved in its present location today. There's an old Z-Class locomotive with a time freight coming out. One Now, one of those platform lamps that you see there, I have one in my front yard. It came from the platform at Williamson. And it says NW Railway on it. This is out at Breeden. Uh, had a water tank out there in a pond and it was a very rough area had a rough bunk, bunch of uh, Markhams that lived out there and uh, they had an old uh, going back to Wade Markham and his sister and all that and they burnt one another's mill and because uh, they were jealous of the other getting too much toll and they said Uncle Wade rode the rode his mule and Sis was sitting on her front porch rocking and crocheting and said he spat and said, You burnt my mail, didn't you, sis? And uh I said she never missed a gate and said, Yes, Giddens said you burnt mine. And uh but they had her offspring by the name of John B. Markham and uh, there were some special agents uh killed up there and uh, it was a right mean place they would harass the train crews and different things this is uh, I read a Markham there she had a store up there and she loaned me these pictures she was brother brother to John B Markham tunnel guards during World War two at the Dingus Tunnel. And uh, various trains out there during the double tracking of uh, Big Sandy in 1925. You can, they kept about 26 work trains that would come back into Canova on the weekends. But uh, On the uh, night of December 5th, 1920, uh, Captain Brockus from the State Police and John Setvin and other detectives of the NW, they uh, made a night run with a crew up to Breeden and uh, they were after Ira McLeod and John B. and a little fellow named Cornbread Dent that carried a six shooter as big as he was, they said. He's only about five foot six. And I had an interview with him too. And uh, anyway, John B. jumped off the engine and uh, John B. Markham and as the, Mr. Carter told me, he said they shot him in the air like a squirrel. And uh, that, that put an end to all the shenanigans up there. They'd robbed the crews and the shanty cars, and they were awfully tough on blacks. There was a gentleman named Wilson D. Kirk that lived at Missouri Branch. He later operated the filling station, and uh, he told me the last month that uh, he worked on the section up there that they found three dead Negroes hanging in the fence line. So it was it was, it was really a rough, tough area, and. Uh, one time, uh, Sutphin uh, was after Cornbread Dent, and uh, he was down in a gondola, and they were shooting at one another, and Sutphin, the special agent, was on the running board of a tank car, and uh, he didn't have anywhere to take cover, and he dropped off at Dingus and went down into Logan and got the CNO back to Canova. And years later, uh, in the 40s, uh, Mr. Uh, Den had taken a dose of religion by then and whatever. And he said the old man Sutphin came by him, looked at him, stopped, and turned around, looked at him, and motioned for him to come out on the vestibule. 
he said they went out there and said something and something shook the cigarette pack and gave him a cigarette and lit his cigarette for him and they both lit up and he said told him he said cornbread said i've done my level best to try and kill you one time said they shook hands and said dent said he looked him right now and said brother i've done the same so that was quite a thing back in those days Again, the tunnel guards that were there on World War I and the Dingus Tunnel. Here's a, a double tank on one of the work trains that uh, they started uh, double tracking the Big Sandy Line in 1924 and completed it in uh, 1926 and that more or less uh, relegated the old line, the old 12-pole line, to a branch line. And all they had on it was the local passenger train and the local freight. They would route trains over in an emergency. But uh, it was abandoned between Wayne and Lenore in 1933. This shows some of the bridge work and double tracking the big sandy line. That's out in the area of Needle and Cyrus. Williamson from the East End and uh, the Great White Way as they call downtown Williamson. You can see a sign from the motor company there. The Mountaineer Hotel built in 1927. Henry Ford and John Kennedy and many other notables stayed there. Henry Ford had captive mines across uh, from Williamson at Stone, Kentucky. Fordson Coal Company, they were managed by Edsel. And uh, he would periodically run a Ford dealer special from Detroit to Norfolk and stop along the way and inspect these mines. And that's how my grandfather got killed. Uh, there was a Ford dealer special on February 18th, 1926. Some of the men on his crew wanted to slip off and see that all the trains at Canova stopped uh, and the car inspectors went over back in those days up until 1942 on every passenger train had like 10 minutes in the station and they wanted to try to get a glimpse of him on his private car the Fairlane uh, he continued to switch down below on the belt line uh, someone was running the engine that wasn't qualified to do so came down uh, on top of him with a draft of cars too hot. He was breaking in a new man. He told him to go down the side ladder. He jumped down on the gondola with wise pipes and uh, the hits uh, uh, hard the load shifted and mashed him. Lived about six hours and he died. There's the second roundhouse at Williamson. And some of the coal camps, uh, Aflex and various ones. See the colors of red and green and, of course, white and kind of a cream with black were trim colors. Here's a timetable from the 1929. NMW had introduced the Pocahontas and the Cavalier in 1926 and 27, their first name trains, and they were updated with luxury equipment. This is at Kermit, uh, the old depot. F.G. Staker was the agent, and uh, he had a son, Zane Gray Staker, that was a Notable attorney at Williamson. I don't know whether any of you ever recall seeing the series Hawkins on law with Jimmy Stewart about a country lawyer from West Virginia. But that was, it was a, had about maybe six episodes, I don't know, late 60s, early 70s, but, but that was based on uh, Zane Gray Staker, and I know some of his people. But I had an interview with the old man. He was quite a character, and uh, Andy Scott lived right across the alley from me in Canova, was his clerk. He passed away last year. This is number 20, a local between uh, Canova and Williamson daily. 
uh, stopped at Kermit with 591, an E1 locomotive. Uh, I had the 597 number plate, and that uh, that's down in the Make One Depot replica in the museum. They've they really butchered that down there from what our uh, graphic layout was and whatever. We really did a nice nice job on it when it first opened. Another view of the station at Kermit gives you an idea of people waiting around to see the trains and see who was coming and going. That was kind of a favorite hangout in the community. This is the station at Canova shows you trains of three railroads. Uh, had about 30 trains a day. Uh, that's the N and W on the upper level, the C and O over on the right, and then a B and O train is uh, back down into the platform there. Uh, they had a shed and a brick platform. The B and O trains they had two each way between Canova and Pittsburgh, and uh, two between uh, uh, one between Canova and uh, Wheeling and one each way between Canova and Parkersburg. And that lasted the B&O service up uh, to about 1957, although they moved on up the street. But uh, that was quite a place, and people from the penitentiary and the Hatfields and all would change uh, trains there. Wasn't uncommon to see men in shackles, and uh, there was a, uh, a murder there, and like I said previously, a birth there, so it was quite a quite a place. It's torn down in uh, 1976. I got a few things from it. This is the station over at Ironton. It's now a restaurant called The Depot. It closes and opens back up periodically. There were three stations similar to this. Uh, a larger one uh, to this design at Roanoke which is still there, and that's now the Visitor Center and the old Winston Link Museum. I wrote Link's book, Steam, Steel, and Stars. But the, well, there's one at Petersburg, too, so all three of this design are still standing. This is down at the uh, Hatfield Tank in the winter of 1930. Y-class engine uh, coming uh, uh, east, railroad east, south, sort of. And another timetable they updated to in the, the 1930s. This uh, was about the time they abandoned the old line. The uh, Interstate Commerce Commission uh, sanctioned a series of pictures to show with the abandonment case. And these Prestons uh, uh, had a store and everything out there. He worked on the railroad. I've, I've got a tape of him. He was quite a resource to me, a gentleman named Bob Preston. And uh, this is out at Genoa. Shows the side track and the mail crane and the shelter shed. These were all taken right before the abandonment of the old line in 1933. And the dog hole mines and the little cross tie sawmill opera operations, they weren't enough to support the continuation of the 12 pole line. This is out in the breeding area, an old sawmill abandoned. See the old log shingle construction over there, which was so predominant all down through along the old line, all down through McDowell County and all that originally. This is Radnor, and the, Bob Preston had that barn and lived in it on the right, and they'd remodeled it into a house and store his wife Ethel. So I got to be real good friends with them. This is Dunlow. The station is still standing, albeit in disrepair. There was a lady by the name of Cora Deerfield that owned it, and uh, she kept pretty good care of it and mowed around, but it's all the weeds and everything are growing up around it. It really ought to be restored in some way. 
There's the station at Dunlow, a little second class combination freight and passenger station. They had a telegraph operator there. It was quite a village in its day. It had a doctor and a coal company and uh, several stores. Again, some of the little mom and pop stores. This is in the 40s at Williamson. Uh, the old round house had been torn down, the, the smaller one, and that uh, new one on the upper part or the toward the left is the one still standing and uses a car shop today, but it was the last uh, one to stand. And it's the last, in fact, it's the last round house standing anywhere on the Norfolk and Western system. There's a train coming into Williamson. Back about the time of the war, I had a friend that uh, W.T. Ross was uh, an operating vice president and superintendent of transportation. He was a road foreman between Portsmouth and Williamson and knew a lot of these old men and we got to be good friends. He just passed away a couple years ago and he was coming in with a troop train with a 1204 that uh, on Pearl Harbor Day and the little boys were running up and down the platform with the extra newspapers that the Pearl Harbor had been bombed. So this is kind of symbolic of that time. This is the Powhatan era with their, not, not this, the Cavalier, excuse me, but that's the streamline equipment that was introduced uh, in 1941 and the J came out and the first streamlined cars on the Cavalier and the Pocahontas. This is taken at the east end of Williamson from the Kentucky side. and You can see a mountain homestead farm there in the foreground. And again, the war years. Railroads were very patriotic. This is one of the 1200s that were used west of Williamson and east of Roanoke. They were, uh, they could haul coal and, you know, they, they could haul 175 cars, uh, 50 ton hoppers and time freights and passenger trains at 70 mile an hour. The 42 of them, the 1218 is still, uh, in the transportation museum at Roanoke, and they ran excursions with it also. This is at Nolan. Uh, 1204 blew up there in uh, 1942. The operator there, Bob Ward, the uh, telegrapher, copied, his son was killed in World War II, and he copied the message himself that came over the Western Union wire. These are the modernized engine service facilities at Williamson in 1947. The uh, second roundhouse had been torn down to accommodate that. They go through these lubricatoriums and be inspected and lubricated and they sort of dieselized in theory uh, NMW by far was the most efficient steam railroad. They built their own engines in Roanoke and had the streamlined servicing. There's out the window of the office. Shows a K1 on the train between uh, Bluefield and Williamson and the A and then the Y6. And then these are the three trains that were the primary trains in the later years. Pocahontas, the uh, Powhatan era, and the Cavalier. This is the first Powhatan era leaving Williamson on its maiden run in uh, 1946. And that's the crowd that came out to see it, part of it at the east end of the platform. Those locomotives and that train were quite the thing in those days.
That shows the uh, westbound train, the crowd on the that came out to see it, the first train. <clears throat> Those uh, houses built up there are called Russell Steps. I had a friend of mine that his dad had one of them, and uh, <clears throat> he grew up there. This is the modernized station that they did modernization in 1947 and 48. New uh, shelter shed and baggage building, whatever. Interior of the depot that once it was modernized, this this is the way it looked right before the, it was given to the city. You can see the new stand over there on the left. Union News Company. This is the new Powhatan area, even though they had rebuilt equipment for it in 1946, they uh, ordered new equipment from Pullman and Standard in 1949, and it was a, the train was absolutely beautiful. It was America's last great steam train. And that, that's on exhibition. They had an exhibition run, and uh, that's at Williamson. Class J with X for flags. This is that round in observation. They called that the boat tail. Uh, had the 581, the 582, and this is on the exhibition at Williamson. Those things were absolutely beautiful. I can remember them well. And uh, they took those off in uh, 1957 and sold them to Saudi Arabia. And I got involved with a group that located one of them and tried to get it back, but they'd scrapped it before we could do that. CSX owned Sealand, and I, I was trying to work it out to bring it back on one of those ships. Again, this is Williamson and the coal yard. It's toward the end of steam. That building on the left, four stories, is the old yard office. That's just been replaced by the Bill Fox building. There's a piece of that script from Pond Creek Colliery of NMW, Dime. That uh, structure way over there on the uh, right in the middle was the coaling station. And you can see the mine over to the left in Kentucky, and they had an aerial bucket line to supply that coal wharf from mine, mine mouth right to the coal wharf. Station at Devon, places in uh, southern West Virginia, Mayberry, Devon, English, a few of them. They had uh, Panther, they had two-story stations that had agents' quarters in the remote area where there wasn't anywhere for them to board or whatever. This is the Tri-State Limited that went down to Grundy, Virginia. It ran uh, extra out of Williamson and then ran as a mixed train uh, from Devon to Grundy on the Buckhannon branch. This is at Hurley, Virginia on that train. It's right near where West Virginia, Kentucky, and Ohio come together down on that area below Williamson. Station at Hurley. And 1956 was the last really big coal rush year for steam. Uh, this is uh, shown uh, they had a real, the really uh, movement on to expedite the cars to, to get as many turns as they could out of them. Uh, keep them rolling was their theme. And those A class engines played a role in that. Here comes one out with a loaded coal train as an empty train is going back into the yard and uh, that's shot from the freight station at Williamson which was built in 1952 and housed the Williamson Daily News where I worked. It was recently torn down. There's Williamson in the 50s. Uh, the uh, Jays were taken off the passenger trains in July of 1958 and uh, 
the uh, A's off the Canova District pretty much in August and November of 1958. Although Williamson was the last place NWU steam, some of the mine run shifters were based there uh, that went up Pigeon Creek and the Kermit and some of those places. There's uh, an extension of the yard that was made uh, in the 50s, way down on the east end, shot from the Kentucky side, two Y-class engines. This is the running repair car shop at Williamson, where they would work on the hoppers and whatever. This is down at Devon. The old gentleman uh, back there standing between the uh, the rail there with the rail between his legs is Bill Economopoulos. He was a extra gang foreman and he was a native of Greece and everybody called him Bill Greek. A lot of Greeks down around Williamson and they operated restaurants and all that. <clears throat> I don't know whether anybody knows Sam Caporalis down there, but his daddy George had the, and his brother had the day and night restaurant. They all worked on the extra gangs and cooked on them before they opened their own restaurants. This is the 611 in uh, the wreck at Cedar on uh, January 23rd of 1956. Killed an engineer. Uh, I had an interview with Ernest Hoback, the fireman, who rode it over into the river. And uh, his... Uh, Hair turned gray immediately thereafter. He was a young man. Took that curve too fast. Luckily, no one else was killed, but that was the last big steam passenger wreck on the NW. And the 611 was saved and rebuilt in Roanoke, and uh, that's the one they're using now for excursions, which I got to run four times. Before they rebuilt it this time, you could see the dents in a couple of places in there tender where they had the dents. And this was the last big steam wreck in 1957 in February at Chatteroy, Goodman actually as they call it. And that's the 1205 turned over uh, in the middle of US 52. And uh, the fireman Turtle Eye Tyree told me that the tug fork was high and that he jumped in it as it turned over and he felt the top of that cab clip his heels as he jumped. But uh, I'm, as I said, I'm the proud possessor of the number plate from that locomotive. And this is uh, the last timetable to have the J on the front. That uh, before they were moved and diesels took over in uh, July of 58. There's a Cavalier at Williamson, 1957. And an A uh, coming out with a train empties out of Portsmouth by the steel mill down there. These are the last days of steam on the Norfolk and Western at Williamson. Larry Fleur and John Cloran made a lot of interesting pictures there. Very poignant. John was one of the principals in the founding of Cass Scenic Railroad. These Y6 engines were used on mine run shifters. This is up at uh, Kermit on the house track, 2154. These are all early 1960. Had a few S1A class engines, that's the 225. I have the number plate off of that too, that front number plate hanging off the headlight the old Cinderella Theater building there. But they had about four of these that they used on the yard, and those four and a handful of the Y6 engines on mine runs were the last steam on the NW. Hmm. There's the deadline down at uh, Bluefield after they were taken out of service. And uh, this is the area where the Ohio Extension was joined up uh, down at Raw, West Virginia. Uh, the two halves were joined there on the 
September 22nd, I believe, of 1892, and I worked with Dr. Frederick Armstrong to uh, do a historic marker on behalf of the Norfolk Western Historical Society. So it's still there. And uh, there it is in all its radiant glory. That was hard to write all that and get what you wanted to say within so many characters. There's the milepost 466 down there at the bottom where they were joined. They later moved it. It was vandalized up there, so they moved it to an area uh, in a curve on the east of there, about a block. Kind of a poignant shot that shows the main line down the Tug Valley and cut of cars there. This is at White, just uh, east of Matewan, a famous uh, lithograph of the NW. That's a DeLorean branch there, uh, and that bridge you see that went over to Majestic Collieries over into Kentucky. But that NW was big on these type of pictures and publicity, and had a really great public relations department. They were proud of their steam locomotives. So that concludes my presentation. That's a clear signal. It's a match cover, but uh, that's the old position light signals like they use. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. I thank you for your attention. <laughs> Tried to throw a little off the cuff some of the stories and whatever in there, but uh, there's, you know, it's, it's unbelievable some of the tales and anecdotes. I, I hope to make this book my, called the Tadpole Line. I hope to make it my master's thesis. And uh, I even interviewed an old man that uh, was part of the Preston family. That uh, he remembers the right of that way agent coming, and he was up in the loft of the log cabin out there in the. Radnor area coming and uh, negotiating with his father down at the supper table to buy land for the right of way back about 18 and 90 or whatever so a lot of things to put in there all right any questions Rick yes yeah, sir uh, this is this is uh, a question on 50 and 51, the card. Yes, sir. There was a railroad, uh, a between Chicago and D.C. that doesn't run all on Chessie system track. What is that short line railroad in Virginia? Buckingham Branch. What's it? What's it? Buckingham run? Branch Railroad. Runs between Clifton Forge and uh, over to uh, Orange on that. And runs on Southern on into the old Southern, Norfolk Southern now on into D.C. and then up the, they changed the electric engines in Washington and run on up uh, on Amtrak. It hangs up there occasionally. Where they really get hit is the Chicago. If you get out of your operating window in Chicago where all those railroads cross, if you get very far out of your window, that's, that's when they start taking the delays and where it gets late. It's late more west, late more uh, eastbound than it is westbound. Okay, there's there's two sections of track in Illinois. There's there are 30 miles with no passing sidings. What are the names of those? Uh, that's that's out there on uh, part of the old uh, C and O and Monon and all that out through Lafayette and that area. Yeah. But uh, ridership's increased. They uh, keep talking about taking it daily. I was an engineer on it for uh, 13 years, and uh, I made 60000 more a year working three days a week for Amtrak than I did as a vice president at CSX. So 
I made good use of my time. I didn't spend much time at home, but on my layover at Charlottesville, I would go to the UVA library and the copies were free and I'd go through the old Roanoke Times and the Bluefield paper and just like I've spent up here today working on a lot of things and that's where I gleaned a lot of that. There was some, there was some reinvestment funds available. How come West Virginia did not take advantage of that? A lot of states did, a lot of cities did. Well, the Heartland Quarter on Norfolk Southern was uh, where those tunnels were lowered and uh, cut out for double stacks and a lot of that money in a private public partnership went to that but frankly West Virginia does not contribute much to Amtrak. When I was resident vice president they had a hundred thousand dollars a year earmarked for that commu commuter operation up in the eastern panel, panhandle that marked the Maryland Area Regional Commuter Authority. And I, they wouldn't write me a check. I had to go to the Court of Claims and get it every year. But if West Virginia doesn't step up, a lot of the, the new mandates for Amtrak, uh, you know, are requiring the states uh, to step up and participate more in the funding of Amtrak. If West Virginia doesn't step up, you know, I'm, I'm afraid they're gonna lose this train. They'd like to take this train daily. See, Florida East Coast has got two brand new passengers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, a lot of these routes have grown on Amtrak, and uh, they're, they're paying for themselves, and uh, a lot of them could, could support double daily service, a day and a night train now. But uh, uh, they, they just put a new service on the Roanoke, and that's happened. Uh, they, they put a train from uh, Lynchburg to Boston to to serve Charlottesville. And uh, a lot of that short run traffic was taking up the long haul space on the Crescent. People that were going from New York to New Orleans didn't have any space for them. So those trains took the preponderance of that short haul business and opened up with more profit a long haul on the, the Crescent. But that train's doing really well. They just, just extended it to, to Roanoke last month. You got a tractor trailer turning over daily on Interstate 64. Tell me about it. What, what could be wrong with running a commuter from Huntington to Charleston? Well, the railroad doesn't want to get into that. The freight railroads don't. You know, they'll, they'll gag it a night and swallow an elephant. You know, I'm, I'm kind of tell it like it is. You know. But, uh, you know, we don't, we don't have the coal traffic that we had. Uh, coal is not as bad off as they'd want you to believe, but uh, it's still, the haulage is way more than it was back in the old days when the C&O and the N&W and were thought as the two primary coal roads and that's where they got all their profit out of. They're still hauling way more than that, but they're not, not what you know. They're not hauling what they were a couple of years ago. The export business comes and goes. Old King Cole's been on the mat many times and gets back up. So I don't know what'll happen. Environmentally, it looks like some real problems. But. I, I used to be able to. I was 12 years old. I could fly the train down at Eastman, ride to Montgomery, go to the movies. And Right yeah, yeah, back in the days of the passenger service in C&O. You mentioned the, the uh, well, the train stops up in the, just outside of Williamson there, Gray. Gray, yes. And it, it, the, uh, apparently they changed it back over, over to Williamson. Yeah, that was done in 1901. I had a three-stall roundhouse at Gray and about a four track yard and uh, you can go down there with a metal detector where the yard used to be in that area and find old Lincoln pen couplers because all that was taken out before the days of magnetized electromagnetic cranes you know where they could just sweep and suck up the spikes and all the metal and so 
I've been wanting to go down there sometime in the winter when the copperheads and the rattlers aren't out prowling about. Did the uh, NNW use date nails? Yeah. When did they stop that? Uh, in the 60s. I've got a total collection of that. If anybody would ever like to come down, you know, take uh, one of my brochures here. I'm, I'm not exaggerating in saying that I have one of the finest private collection of railroad artifacts in the country. I have a depot uh, and the agent's office, just like walking into an old NW country station and that Fox uh, Network antique show when they were in Huntington, they did a segment from the house. They had the people with their curios down in my living room and uh, then upstairs in my office. And I, I can look out and see both the C&O and the NW main lines, CSX and Norfolk Southern. Randy? I mentioned it was off the rough up in Dingus. My uh, great grandmother used to catch the train there at Breeden. Yeah. And uh, she always mentioned that don't go over in Dingus, it's a rough area. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty mean. Pretty rough in this day. And I, I remember here back in the 80s, there was a guy that got killed and he laid in the, laid in the road like four hour, hours before the state police even showed up to do their paperwork and everything on it. Well, one of my friends, a uh, fellow by the name of Eric Simon, he does a lot of metal detecting there around the uh, Dingus Tunnel. Uh -huh. And he's found an awful lot of uh, lead and you know, bullet cases. And things. Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, it was quite a thing, you know. I'll have a chapter on that in my, my book. They, they called that bunch up there the Owl Hoot Gang. And uh, they just about hung a woman up there that gave them a venereal disease. And <laughs> it was, uh, they didn't want anybody, outsiders coming in and working in their area and whatever. And they'd run them out of there. And, uh, but uh, those were quite the times. All right, anybody got anything else? I appreciate your attention and uh, thank you for letting me speak to you tonight.